Great. So welcome, everybody, and a special welcome to Rebecca. Rebecca is one of our new Berkman Fellows this year, part of the uh, new class for 2014-2015. In addition to that, uh, she's also an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School and the faculty director of the Global Health Delivery Project, of which we have a couple of staff members here, in addition to uh, many other accomplishments and uh, titles. But uh, we're so pleased to welcome Rebecca and take care. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I actually asked to be one of the first <laughs> contenders here. And caveat, Gretchen and I went to college together uh, way, way back. And Gretchen said, why did you decide to go first? And actually, the reason why I wanted to go first is because I actually desperately need your help. So I'm an outlier in the system, and I'm learning all this new vocabulary. I didn't know what link rot meant. I didn't know what an SNI was, server name indication. And I'm like cataloging all the new vocabulary that I'm getting from being part of the Berkman community. I'm hoping I'll have a, new, a few new vocabulary words for some of you uh, who may not be healthcare related. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do is spend about 12 minutes on our central prod, uh, problem and three different products that we've developed at the Global Health Delivery Project. And then actually my main question for you all today is how do we design digital badges for healthcare implementers? And understanding that ecosystem, which I think many of you are within or in proximity to, how best we incentivize our healthcare professionals for continuous learning. So this is whom we're going to be serving today. So this is my friend Lorenzo Dorr. He's um, a 50-year-old physician assistant in Liberia. He has four children and a grandchild. And he just left the capital, Monrovia, Liberia, the Western African country, to move to a rural area where they've identified one case of Ebola. He's now the only healthcare provider for 300,000 people. He's actually also our student in 2012. And we gave him an introduction to management, strategy, supply chain, and he is now, in a sense, responsible for containing this virus. I think many of you may know this is what Ebola looks like or seen it yourself. You need a PCR to actually identify, and there's two PCR machines in the entire country of Liberia. Um, the New England Journal has been doing an extensive series. It's all posted online. Ebola in a stew of fear, and I just highlight here quarantine. So this is the new technology we're using to contain this virus. Quarantine, the words from Italian, I don't know if anyone knows what it's, what, when it was developed. No? So if it's for the plague in the 17th century, that when people came off a ship, they needed to wait for 40 days before they could actually be released on land. And we're using basically the same technology that we're using from the plague. So my first question for us all to think about is how can we contain a virus? You can see some, some, some of the answers below. So I'm an easy teacher here. So vaccines, a PCR machine, how we diagnose software, right, which we'll talk about, healthcare professionals, and then all of the above. And I think you all can see some of the metaphors here. OK, so our central problem of the Global Health Delivery Project is what we call the implementation bottleneck, that we know upstream there's been tremendous investment in the discovery, the basic science of disease, development, the new tools, so the products, the diagnostics, as well as the therapeutics needed for healthcare delivery, but less investment in the gritty business of delivering those products and services to change the health outcomes of populations. And that sounds like a grand theory, but that's actually the ROI, the return on investment, that most people assume these products have. And there's been massive investment right on that second piece, the development of new products. This list here that I've listed, microbicides, malaria, and TB diagnostics checklist, the major new funder in the space has been the Gates Foundation. And so they're now questioning, after 20 years of investment, what has the, in a sense, what has been the change in the health outcome of populations? So our team's um, argument here is that the lens on healthcare delivery has been, in a sense, too narrow. And with Michael Porter's advice at Harvard Business School and his mentorship, we've taken, taken about um, this notion of value-based healthcare delivery. And value is defined as health outcome over cost. And that should encompass the discussions that are happening about access to health care, equity, and quality health care. So one of our suggestions um, that we began about seven years ago is how do we create a pedagogy in value-based health care delivery? And we kind of leaned on Mike Porter at this point, who had developed this for microeconomics of competition. He had created a series of curricula for advanced health care economies. Though we followed him suit, and we created a series of um, Harvard Business School case studies. There's now over 30. They're at no cost uh, to the users, both the faculty members and the students. And we iterate and teach them in our classrooms here. 
Um, the reason why I kind of show you the site is I actually hope you all will go and download and if you're interested, read some of the cases as well as the teaching notes behind it. But um, the reason why I'm showing you this at the Berkman Center is when we actually put the cases up, we broke Harvard Business Publishing's website for 24 hours, I'm pleased to say. Because when you put something in the shopping cart at Harvard Business Publishing and the price is zero, it didn't work. AKA, it was the first time, right, this academic publishing house had given something away for free. That took probably longer than writing some of the cases, right? So the second uh, product line we do is courseware. So we offer our courses um, both during the academic year as well as the summer. We have a mid-level management course called the Global Health Delivery Summer Intensive, um, where we have students from about 40 countries join us. We've also used our case studies in an edX version called Global Health Case Studies from a Biosocial Perspective that went up uh, earlier this spring. Um, and I think in this room, I know there's been many discussions about MOOCs and evaluating and monitoring the MOOCs. We also had that significant drop off after the first month. Um, and they're thinking through how you, in a sense, create continuous learning on an online platform. The last piece of kind of our product line that I want to just end here for a moment is we created frameworks. How do we inform professionals today to generate value-based healthcare delivery? And for any of those who are interested, I'm pleased to walk you through this theory. We connect the theory to our case examples so that the new professional can actually understand how to deliver value-based healthcare. But as an academic, I can tell you that this is insufficient. This is retrospective work that doesn't help you anticipate the problems ahead, nor does it actually help Lorenzo as he's trying to contain Ebola today. So our team thought through the types of questions our healthcare professionals have. And as we've discussed, I think in this room, the fire hose effect of information that has created this complex maze. And we watch our healthcare professionals put into Google antiretroviral therapy or resistance um, or I need to, a new diagnostic for tuberculosis and get millions of hits. And so we thought through how could we be that navigation through this maze. So we launched uh, almost seven years ago now, ghdonline.org. Uh, it's a series of professional virtual communities. And our team decided that they needed to leverage wisdom of the crowds with these four characteristics. Diversity of opinion, independence of thought, decentralized, and then we needed to aggregate this in some way that can make this consumable for the newcomer to ghonline.org. <clears throat> so this is where we ended up um, in the aims of the communities. First, they would clearly have a global perspective to healthcare delivery. There'd be crowdsourced insights. We would actually have the discussions be moderated. And this related to the quality of the content that we hoped, in a sense, um, transmit to our users. And then the archives needed to be searchable. So this is seven years ago, and DECA helped um, create, us create the back end for our search. And this is, in a sense, a relatively new phenomenon, especially for our global health colleagues. And today, this is kind of where we're at. I don't like to necessarily show quantitative numbers, because it doesn't necessarily show the depth of conversation. Um, but we have had a daily post for the last two years. Every day, someone has posted something. And I think that shows actually virology in some ways, going back to a good form of virus. Not all, not all viruses are bad. Um, the 182 countries is pretty significant. We don't know how we got there. So those of you who like to map out connections and understand networks, we would love your help. Um, there's been no marketing scheme. There's no emblems. No one's getting paid, <laughs> aka the users, and there's no subscription fee to join. Um, just to mention an aside, so this is a series of photographs of our moderators. Some of you may notice Paul English here um, from Kayak and now Blade. Um, was a, a tremendous inspiration for us in the beginning of GHD Online. And what we do in many ways is not only bring academics and implementers, but we actually try and attract our users who become super users to serve as moderators over time and help build that capacity and that capital within country. We have 40 expert moderators to date, 42. Um, 30 are from advanced economies and 12 are from research limited settings. Here is just to give you a sense of kind of the communities that we actually host. Um, <clears throat> a significant number are in the private, i.e. you need to be invited by the moderator to join those communities, and the rest you can see are within the, in the public realm. Our first four communities were tuberculosis infection control. I just want to highlight that for a moment. So this is a community of engineers, architects, tuberculosis docs, who are trying to understand how to decrease the transmission of tuberculosis in both a hospital and the community-based setting. So this includes the vendors for your lighting, right? the masks that you need to de decrease the transmission. And clearly, when new healthcare providers are seeing not only multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, but 
XDR TB, extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. There are technical features of what you should be wearing and how you should, in a sense, both identify that um, first case and then contain the resistance if possible. So as we were building all these communities, we realized we were, in a sense, unfortunately, reproducing what we do in academia all the time is create silos of knowledge and information. Um, and sitting in an academic hub at the medical school, I see I don't even know some of my colleagues at the medical school because we're not necessarily sitting in the same department or, sit, or seeing patients on the same floor of the hospital. And so we clearly wanted to create some bridges across these communities because we knew these professionals not only did not know each other in person, nor did they know each other virtually. So our team experimented on the notion of an expert panel, which is an asynchronous conference that runs for four business days. And they're moderated by panelists who bring in new expertise into these panelists across several of the communities. So an example here is one on connected health. Um, and there's two communities involved. We then summarize them into what we call discussion briefs, which are two-page PDFs that all members can download. Another example here is about point-of-care diagnostics. So there's a group. Um, that received a large grant to think through point-of-care diagnostics for cancer care and control, and they wanted to learn how this was done for HIV, right, the test, um, the CD4 test, and then we actually went back, and in this discussion, we actually talked about the pregnancy test and some of the ethics of the development of the pregnancy test and obviously the manufacturing distribu distribution of the pregnancy test uh, within the home setting. We've also tried to look at how we create a global community. And this is something else we would love your help with. Um, this is one visualization that we try and understand who begins a discussion on GHG Online, who's answering the discussion. And if we can find some of our bridge professionals, which I know Zuckerman's um, spoken about, within these uh, countries. So for example here in Chile, all of the orange, these are the outward lines. This is someone starting a discussion in Chile. And if they're answering it, um, a US question and a Chilean is answering it, then the color is responding there. So there's a very active exchange and dialogue happening with our Chilean colleagues. And then there's several of our colleagues who we realize are only asking or generating a discussion and are less maybe willing or able um, to answer. So a lot to dive in here and interesting data. If anyone's interested, we'd love your help. Um, OK, so let's go back to Lorenzo, because he's on my mind on a daily daily basis. So right now, if you think of the trajectory of Ebola, in March, the first case was identified in Guinea, and people thought this was going to be an isolated epidemic. And that has happened previously, that we've had other outbreaks um, in the Congo and Sierra Leone, and they've been able to be contained. And now I think many of you know there's a use case in Nigeria, in the capital of Nigeria. There are two Americans aerovac to the United States and given some serum. This is a very complicated international discussion. And why people are now projecting that there will be 20 to 25,000 cases of Ebola within this calendar year. That is, we're on the wrong part of the exponential curve right now. And Lorenzo is struggling. How do I manage to contain this virus as a physician assistant? And how can we get him some of those answers and that brain trust that we're, we have access to? So here's Lorenzo. Just wanted to show you. This is, he is with us in 2012, wearing his librarian garb every day, an avid learner. He needed to learn how to use Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all, all the rest of it while he was sitting with us. And now is quite, uh, quite active. And we need to, in a sense, maintain his sense of continuous lear learning, even in the midst of this emergency. So this is kind of the question uh, for today is what are the right carrots to set up for Lorenzo, in the, not only in the midst of this emergency, right, but over the course of his career that we're struggling with. And what we see for many of our colleagues in resource limited settings, there aren't the carrots that we have in advanced economies where I am required as a physician to maintain continuing medical education points. And my nursing colleagues maintain their continuing nursing education. They are actually paid, and you are responsible for maintaining a portfolio. In addition, we find for many of our clinicians, they are now in roles as managers. They are managing people, products, and money with no training in how to do this. And how can we leverage the expertise we have within our own brain trust here, as well as our colleagues on GHD Online, to ensure that they are prepared for their roles ahead? So our premise that we'd love to get your ideas on is how do we create this digital badge that is on Lorenzo's portfolio, um, profile on GHD Online? So you can see this is where how many times he's contributed, the communities that he's contributed in. And we'd love to start seeing him stack his badges on his GHG Online profile. Just to take a step back, what our team did was look back on how other badges were developed, both for products, 
for buildings and for professionals. And if there's also anyone in this space who has expertise, this is really why we're coming to the Berkman Center to understand how to do this well. Um, I think many of you probably drank a cup of fair trade coffee this morning. I don't know if there's any DEA agents in the room, <laughs> but kind of intimidating when someone puts out their DEA badge. When I'm, in, when, the, when I'm in the hospital, I have to wear my badge right here, right, so all the patients know who I am, what my role is, who, whom I'm taking care of, and how can we do this for our healthcare providers? So this is kind of what our team is thinking through and breaking down is if, if we took on the role of being the issuer of this badge and the earner was Lorenzo and our colleagues on GHD Online, we'd hope the consumer would be governments and multilaterals that the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria would say, I want 10,000 managers in every country badged at level blue, for example, and that they would generate the demand. The value of the credential would have to be set by a group, um, which I think we could actually collaborate with. And then the stackability portability issue would be is this would actually be not only on your LinkedIn profile, but also within the Ministry of Health's requirements for professional education. And this is where we in a sense generated some demand that we have new ministers of health interested in this idea. They want to say this is part of the responsibility of healthcare providers, but we need to figure out how to build it right. So our hope is that Lorenzo will not only have been a student and a collaborator with us, but now he will be a recognized professional. So my question kind of to lead to start the discussion off here is how can we optimize skill-based credentialing? And a few easy answers that I could come up with, but I need your help for the others, is what I do every year is I, in a sense, attend CME. So I go to a session, I get a CME credit. I also do this online with um, an evidence-based body of, called Up to Date. I don't read the New England Journal cover to cover. I read my New Yorker cover to cover. <laughs> <laughs> um, earning digital badges. And then things I'm trying to keep up with is read all the posts on our listserv. Um, I don't know if anyone else is keeping up here. Uh, but the massive, you know, fire hose effect of being part of a community. <coughs> and how can we sort this through? Uh, so I'm going to leave us with that. And just um, last point. So um, Julio Frank, I don't know if anyone follows, but he was the previous Minister of Health in Mexico. He's serving as dean. He's a wonderful mentor to us um, at, the, at the project. And this is why he thinks this is the work of us, and this is an interdisciplinary effort to think about health improvement and health systems. So in our turbulent world, health improvement can be a bridge to peace and prosperity, an antidote to intolerance, and a source of shared security. So I just want to acknowledge this is the efforts of many, including Abby and Angie and our massive team uh, of community members on GHD Online and our advisors, and hoping to start the discussion to fuel our efforts. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I'll go back to this. If anyone wants, to, anyone has an easy answer to this. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to talk to people in the education field. Uh, I work. Um, I'm Amy Tsung, and I um, I'm a fellow here, but I also work for uh, NTIA Department of Commerce, and we funded. Um, curriculum development in um, New York City high schools, which basically built a platform for badging to be used with high school. So the incentive was not was not only sort of, not a replacement for grades, but just sort of this like um, continual kind of reward for mm -hmm. and recognition mm -hmm. for learning skills. So skills included things like posting on a blog, mm -hmm. um, contributing yeah. to a forum, that sort of yeah. thing. So it wasn't so much necessarily formalized, uh, as well as some people were using it to go get through a, a online class or something mm -hmm. like that. So it just mm -hmm. seems like there's a, yeah. a good parallel mm -hmm. between Absolutely. the education space. Mm -hmm. No, would love an introduction. Okay. I have similar ideas to, to, to what you just said, that you have, you sort of have two orthogonal sets of skills. There are the skills yeah. you need to do your task, yeah. and then the skills you need to get the information you exactly. need to do your task. Yeah. Exactly. And it feels almost like language acquisition, grammar mm -hmm. versus vocabulary, yeah. that, that you having one helps you get the other, and then there's sort mm -hmm. of a, a ladder. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. there's sort of an interesting way of, of you know, mm -hmm. we almost take for granted the tools mm -hmm. we need to get the information because yeah. it's we're so fluent in them. Yeah, absolutely. So an analogy I've been just thinking about. So um, I have a second grader at home, 
and he has a spelling test every week. And on <clears throat> Mondays, he gets a pretest where the teacher dictates a set of words. Then he has to self-correct. He can see the list. On Wednesday, he has to write a sentence for every word. And on Friday is the spelling test. And very similar, I mean, I think his notion of actually even also being able to self-correct is something quite powerful. Um, and I'm trying to think of this second grader's been doing this, second grade teacher's been doing this about 45 years. <laughs> Did a lot more experience than I do in pedagogy. Yes, yes, that's what we've noticed as well, yes. <laughs> um, but I'm glad petition has been on, on the list. Well, American elms are dying, so that's... Yes, that's what other people... Yeah, yeah. Um, but this type of expertise is, I think, definitely one element that we're looking for. Um, and obviously, the internet literacy and being able to participate, because um, we see many of the people that we want to be completing the MOOC, right, are unable to participate for some of the, I would say, prerequisite reasons you may need to be a consumer. Mm -hmm. the platform. Yeah, thank so, you. Really grateful to have you here and, oh, and <laughs> collaborate just as well. Um, this is, uh, by way of context, I think an important moment also for the Berkman Center. So we may not have all the answers that, mm -hmm. that you hope yeah. we would have, uh, but I think it's a very important uh, moment for us to as a community really built these bridges mm -hmm. as so many areas and health being a mm -hmm. core area mm -hmm. of course are embracing digital technology mm -hmm. to solve very hard problems mm -hmm. as you described yes. it and that itself seems to be a very important effort um, mm -hmm. I think Berkman has for many years focused on on digital and, and the internet and online stuff mm -hmm. but obviously what you're describing mm -hmm. here is is an environment mm -hmm. where where is that is still pre-digital or mm -hmm. where we don't mm -hmm. immediately think about you know broadband or mm -hmm. facebook mm -hmm. um but oh. where the tools are becoming yeah. part of a, of mm -hmm. a solution for mm -hmm. global problems so mm -hmm. um, i'm very excited that we can um mm -hmm. uh, start this conversation in many respects um one of the things i hope we can offer as a community uh is to to think about some of the lessons learned we've seen uh, in, in what we've been studying in the o online context mm -hmm. over the past uh, a decade or so. And there are a couple of things that come to mind. So um, the first that perhaps comes to mind is how incentives have been, uh, what, we, what we've learned in terms of incentives, mm -hmm. creating incentives mm -hmm. yeah. for, for collaboration mm -hmm. in large groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you look at open source software, mm -hmm. um, there's been a, there's a lot of research actually um, how how that has mm -hmm. created incentive structures mm -hmm. for people to participate and contribute mm -hmm. code mm -hmm. to a shared pool of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to your wonderful mm -hmm. slide with the Chilean participants, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. you you may may yeah. see some similarities mm -hmm. of okay, who are power contributors and and how can we motivate them, for instance, by them becoming, mm -hmm. uh, uh, building reputation within yeah. a community and how can we leverage such mm -hmm. reputational effects mm -hmm. to maintain mm -hmm. um, uh, incentives mm -hmm. to be a collaborator, yeah. listener and, and, and mm -hmm. a contributor, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I think, one possible mm -hmm. angle where we can contribute mm -hmm. to the conversation. A second one that uh, comes to mind um, is of course around the question of skills. So, mm -hmm. um, as as we already heard, this is an interesting blend of multiple types mm -hmm. of skills required. Um, you told the story of your of your friend, right, who had first mm -hmm. to learn the basic computer mm -hmm. literacy, even like how do you use PowerPoint or Word doc. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely uh, what you're building here has some sort of requirements of uh, at the first level mm -hmm. that you can use the tool mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. so we've been engaged um, in an effort how do we think about digital literacy and and mm -hmm. these kind of basic mm -hmm. skills um, that are required that you can use mm -hmm. the tools later on mm -hmm. so that's one yeah. level and then of course you have the mm -hmm. medical skills and, uh, and mm -hmm. all the higher level mm -hmm. skills that um, that you hope to get across mm -hmm. so building on Bruce's mm -hmm. comments but so at this deeper level, I think we have some, some mm -hmm. ideas. And then uh, further up the stack, um, the third area where we hopefully have connection points, and I hope Paulina can weigh in, 
we're thinking about this batching question a lot. Mm. We think about mm. that more in the digital skills context, mm. but there is a very rich discussion and, and Paulina is, is a ed school graduate mm. uh, and, and may have ideas too, mm. uh, what we can take away and mm. potentially translate. Mm. So this is a bit a longer statement, but I wanted yeah, to make sure yeah. that we get the framing right here mm. uh, as you volunteer to yeah, present no. early on. So <laughs> there are a number of things I think mm. we can and uh, connect, yeah, and I'm excited about it. Thank you. I actually have a question, and sorry I came a little late if you answered it. Um, what is the motivation or your main motivation behind the badging? Is it a, a to motivate people to do things, or is it more of a being able to see on the network who has expertise on what topic? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. which, or are they right. both, or what's more important? Right. Um, so I've learned from my dear friend Abby Campbell to set a goal and set some metrics. So she, we did 1,776 push-ups from June 1st to July 4th. I never would have done them unless Abby had been tracking us doing 50 push-ups a day. And so there's something about breaking down a task, right, and being monitored for it. And if you want, having that peer-to-peer -peer relationship that I knew Abby had done her push-ups and not. We do this in medicine all the time, right? I'm actually comparing, I know I need to have 100 points for my CME at the end of the year. We don't compare necessarily physician to physician, but it's in the sense something I need to submit. And for, our, for many of our providers, nurses, midwives, physician assistants, physicians, in the settings that we're talking about, there is no continuation of their graduate medical education after three. And this is an undergraduate degree in nursing or medicine. So this tends to be someone in their early 20s who then, in a sense, is not having that continuous arc of how do I develop as a professional. Pardon me. Uh, so first of all, uh, anybody here who's, who's interested in this, and this was really interesting, and, and um, you know, I certainly agree with Irv about the importance of it. This Friday at 1230, there is a, an open sort of semi-unconference on um, uh, using social media as a way of, of disseminating um, uh, good information to affect healthcare outcomes, especially in the developing world. And disseminating is not even the right world, the word since it's intended also to, to include conversational interactions. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, you should be coming to that. And this would be fantastic to raise there. This is so, um, OK, so the plug aside. Um, in, in the sort of badging that I can, if I think of badging, the sorts of things that I think of are pretty straightforward, and yours is not, unfortunately. Uh, pretty straightforward often because the consequences of the badging are way more trivial, um, much less depends on them, and because it's being done primarily within the online world where the, um, the achievements, the metrics that can be, the achievements can be accomplished online and thus the badging is automatic. So to what extent um, do you intend, do you think, that your badging system can be, uh, to what extent does it have to in involve off, um, offline activities, which uh, will make it more complicated, but not, you know, but perhaps right. way more useful and important? Great, right. an excellent question. I think what we're hoping is some of the early um, capacities that we could build are actually ones that are the quantitative side, so supply chain management, finance and accounting, HR. Those get measured by uh, <laughs> online activity or by right. somebody They'll testing to offline. online activity. The second element that we'd like to incorporate in, which we use on the clinical side, this is to be in parallel with your clinical medicine, is we use a simulator in medicine all the time. So I practice running a code on a patient, and there's a video watching me. My temperature increases, and my heart rate goes up, right? My saliva, and then I'm wa I rewatch that video and review the mistakes that I made with my residents and my fellows there, so they're actually learning as I am uh, managing that code. So can I follow up with the, with the, with the first part? Because sure. the second part it seems easier because you, you have the data, right? So that's, that really helps. Um, uh, supply chain management? Yes. Um, how is Lorenzo, how are you going to know that he, he's mastered right, that? Right, right. So or is, is that where what where you're asking us? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm asking you. So we've been trying to talk to folks who build question banks, right? How to frame the right questions. So. We know, for example, if we give a community health worker 40 different products, that they may have difficulty figuring out which product to get to which patient. 
But for Lorenzo's side, we need to know that he has the skills to understand how to project which products will go out of stock, right? To understand his population size, his burden of disease, the shelf life, for example, the, co the complexity of the cold chain. And so we actually have a simulator where he puts in those numbers and can he create the right projections. Um, but a lot of work to do in that fray, but that's actually almost the easier side. I'd say the harder side with all things in healthcare is the human resources side. It's how do you develop human capacity in a group of individuals organized to deliver care to patients. That is, I agree with you, is a side that needs... That, ...that you can award a badge meaningfully. Right, that so will that, be quite yeah, difficult. And that is the question you're asking us. Yes, well I'm asking really the first is how to at least do we do the first part well. So I'd say the non-clinical piece of healthcare delivery, which is the management of people, so actually job descriptions in general, um, HR 101, accounting, finance, logistics. Uh, and how to design that pedagogy well. This follows up on Amy's question about what actually you're training people for, but it, it looked, uh, what I was hearing was that underlying all of this, you're trying to build trust in, in Lorenzo and others. And uh, that's, we've learned through bad experiences, mm -hmm quite hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the bad experiences I have some familiarity with are in the online e-commerce space. Um, what one plans, uh, the, what one sets up to do to build trust frequently doesn't work for a whole variety of, of reasons. So uh, all I, I this looks pretty straightforward in some sense. I don't know why you would find bad actors in this context. It's shameful. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's when you're building trust, it's, it's something uh, to keep track of because you can lose trust with one, one bad actor. build those courses? I, I mean, I would assume that there's some yes. online courses and resources yes. for those sorts of things that very big. Excellent yeah. point. No, what we'd rather actually okay. build is the pretest, a choose your own adventure algorithm, right? And then the way in which we certify and we, in a sense, leverage the expertise and a bit of the brand that we actually have here at Harvard um, to do that. But I agree. We have actually have a list. There's hundreds of courses out there already. We need to review and ensure that they're decent and then figure out how to create that question bank. And so we've been even looking into the pedagogy of what does testing do to prime your knowledge acquisition. That's why I go back to my second grader spelling test, is that we realize even in the act of testing, and obviously if you even read your, why your answers were wrong, even better, it actually reinforces the learning cycle. Um, so anyone who has colleagues, that, and this is really in the ed school arena, um, we'd love to meet with them to get a sense of how do you even structure these multiple choice. Easy when I give you guys the answer. Interesting when I flip the answers, people focus a little bit better. <laughs> or if you misspell one of the answers, people actually think that that one is wrong. I mean, these are all kind of tricks people are using in the pedagogy. Um, and we find, especially for adults, to maintain your attention when doing an online question bank, which is utterly boring, um, there are some of these tricks um, may be helpful. Um, Ensure completion. For example, if you're accounting, I mean, there, yes. there has to be exactly. tons. I mean, and there are tons yes. of like very basic courses that exactly. have, you know, those. You don't even have to figure out the. I mean, that they have the did yes. you complete it and all that stuff built yes. in. So yeah, the exercises may need to be healthcare related. Okay. Uh, in the end, but absolutely, so that's the word. Yeah. So, the archival community has recently uh, constructed its own certificate system uh, for a digital archive specialist, a series of online courses, and, and go from there. And we faced a kind of chicken and egg situation, is that um, people are doing this in part because they want to, uh, they think it'll make them more employable, get higher mm -hmm. salaries, mm -hmm. things like have the the employers um, mm -hmm. support it, and yet until it's established and and uh, they're aware about it, um, what's doing it. One of the things that surprised me is that there is um, 
has been a tremendous take up just on the part of indiv the individuals have a desire to learn and establish their credentials. And I think you've done a re having the the badge is a really neat idea. We've we've seen this in so many areas. The Wikimedia editors who like to be the super editors and and other people. And so that, you've got really done really well there. But what about on the flip side? The idea of sitting down and saying Lorenzo's going to get more money because yeah. he's gotten your certification and mm -hmm. um, and and the badge carries some weight with it um, administratively. Yes, no, it's absolutely. I think our team internally thinks that is our job to actually sell this to the ministers of health, that we can ensure you that X percent of your managers will have the capacity to manage people, products, and money, and that they should then, and since their salary should be upgraded. Likely, I think we'll need to have a third-party payer into that realm, so it's the multilateral generating that demand. Um, maybe PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or the President's Malaria Initiative, saying, I want this many managers at this level. And I think we can all understand if we have one stock out and you're using one set of emergency funds, so you're needing $200 million of extra dollars to get the malaria bed nets there on time, obviously the ROI of training managers uh, is there. So. Everyone understands the expense of having people not trained um, at the cell, but the expectation that physicians and nurses and midwives know how to manage, um, especially products, for example, um, is, is not what's taught in medical school or nursing school. Are you imagining badges to be like, is the badge just going to be resource or are there going to be like smaller badges within it? Right. I think. Absolutely. So you're a few levels. I think we'll probably start in one arena and then see if we think of someone who's going to end up running a district level hospital, how far along the continuum. But yes, I think it'll have to be multiple stages because we some folks who are managing 100 community health workers, some people are managing a community health center, and then the district level hospital is if you're managing a catchment area of 300,000 people, it's a different set of skills. Those levels. So have you thought about having, uh, this may be a bad idea, but have you thought about having two categories of badges, ones that are more like play the role of a certificate, uh, okay. be taken more seriously, there's been some, excuse me, and then to accomplish some of the other aim, which um, I forget who said, uh, can, is, can be to in, provide an incentive as well as, uh, uh, so heavy participation, blog, uh, yeah. you know, Champion blogger, blog yeah. five times a, yeah. a month, or this many connections or answer mm -hmm. that many questions. Mm -hmm. um, those also, that'd be a separate category yeah. so that the cer certificate ones have more weight. Right, no, we definitely, we just don't, we're not sure how to do this well. So we want people to be encouraged. We have an engagement period of tracking our members and we don't want to encourage people just to write four or five words, right? We want there to be a quality content. Sure. So we have a recommendation button and all the things well, that so people are using. Ways of, of tuning tuning that. So right. it's not merely posting, Quantity. but yeah, the posting <laughs> that got comments or got picked up or whatever the metric is. But yeah. I, I was trying to make a distinction between, in fact, why not take the badges that are the more serious ones where there's a set mm -hmm. of qualifying right. things you need to do and call them certificates. Mm -hmm or something, since you want them to have a lot of weight, and badging shows up primarily, in my experience, primarily as, well, often anyway, as a um, as an incentive and as a, um, a, it's like a badge. I mean, that's, you know, it's like you get a, give a kid a badge. Mm -hmm. um, good in school today, a or, you know, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a starring system. Um, whereas you, I think, want, at least some of these mm -hmm. to be not just, yeah. yay, good job, right. but right. you can trust this person for yeah. the skill set that she has. Yeah. That's an excellent point about participation versus expertise and where testing will be needed to assume the knowledge has been acquired. What about the connectivity issues? Are you assuming yeah, that everyone yeah. has uh, internet access? Is this a phone? So, um, right. A mobile phone? Um, so, so people ask us this. So five years ago, I would not have said I wouldn't be this confident. But now, to be honest, I mean, we see how our healthcare, pro most people who are graduating from medical school around the globe, the first thing that they want is a smartphone. Ten years ago, they wanted a motorbike. Twenty years ago, they wanted a leather jacket. <laughs> And they don't even want a motor, but they don't even care. They actually just want a connected smartphone. Um, and honestly, many of our providers are actually much more used to moving mobile money 
for example. Minutes are very important to them. We have Nathan Eagle, a close colleague, so I'm sorting through that whole market. So I'm actually much less worried about the hardware at this point because people are very used to hacking systems to get the video that they want. Um, and so I think people will get used to participating, even if the hardware is more limited uh, in the beginning. The second piece I think that we're seeing is so much of healthcare, the equipment is coming with it. So the fourth principle of value-based healthcare delivery is as people are investing in healthcare infrastructure, which is both water, electricity, and the internet, they are stimulating economies uh, in this area. So I do think that it will come with the aid that is coming to many of these regions. Not as fast as I'd like, but I'm much more optimistic than I was five years ago. But then you're making an assumption that the curriculum and the things that you put out, uh, the, the training modules, will be you'll be able to do on a phone, basically. Um, well, some may be on a phone, some may need to be at a kiosk. Some of the hardware, actually the, the laptops and the desktops are coming to the healthcare center. So in the same way when I'm on call for 24 hours, I have a couple hours where I'm not doing as much, right? I could actually do my continuing medical education during that time on a hospital computer or a clinic computer. So Lorenzo has access to a... Lorenzo uh, has access to a computer. To, to a computer. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Might that be as good at, as your computer. You know what? That's good. Um, <laughs> at um, Cornell, we ran the Teal, started the Teal project, which mm -hmm. uh, was agricultural literature that was sent to um, third world countries, primarily African, on CDs, mm -hmm. on the assumption that uh, most people right. didn't have internet access, and mm -hmm. it's now gone to the uh, an online version mm -hmm. and uh, has joined. Hinari and mm -hmm. um, yes. OARE and the Research yes. for Lice initiative, mm -hmm. um, but there's still demand for the yes. um, uh, the CD version mm -hmm. as well. So uh, I'm, uh, you know, and that you, we hear all the time about places that uh, where you can't guarantee Absolutely. four hours of electricity yes. a day, not yes. to mention internet. Yes. Uh, so it, I'm glad to hear that the, at least yes. the medical community is more connected. It's, it, while it goes on and off, if you can cache it in a local area, um, it's not perfect, but it's much better. Do you find any uh, cultural differences in some of the things you're aiming at? I mean, it's occurred to me when mm -hmm. talking about certificates and badges yeah. and stars. Uh, yeah. Recently, I was told that you look at reputation websites in the United States that use stars. <coughs> yeah. Americans always want five stars. The British are satisfied with four stars. Uh, but badge means almost nothing to me. Certificate means a lot to me. We definitely have to do some testing with our users of what, and obviously if things get translated. What we've seen, I agree with you, with our students, so they come from 40 different countries, is they want a printed out certificate, which Abby creates for them, with the dean signing it at the end of our summer course. And we know, and they, people have taken pictures, that they frame these certificates, and it's up on the wall of their office, and it has a Harvard emblem on it um, by, you know, we have permission from the provost and the dean to do that, and that has tremendous meaning. Um, I don't necessarily know if I believe in the brand and that means you're actually well qualified, but yes, I think culturally we're seeing, that you're right, that that is quite important, that there's something to the paper document. And does that mean you've, in a sense, accrued X number of both badges and a certificate that we send you a printout? Um, um, we'll, we'll have to deduce, but excellent question. There's definitely some cultural norms here that, that we need to deduce. I was going to say along those lines, too, because I'm the one responsible for the certificates, um, is that many of the students do their employers ask yes. and require it, that if they're gone, they leave their, their position, their post for a month to come to Boston and learn from us, as they want to see that. And the employers often will subsidize or pay for completely their tuition, which isn't cheap, unfortunately, um, for credit that the school public has. And so it is a, a big yeah. piece. Um, it's a simple piece of paper, but it, for a lot of people, means they get their tuition paid, they can come back, they can take a month of leave. I haven't seen anyone anyone being sold on eBay yet, so here we go. <laughs> no, <that's good>. Then <laughs> I'll know we've made it. <laughs> yes. Do participants from your summer course become champions within this community? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we have over 200 graduates. This is our, we'll be at our seventh summer of running the summer course at this point. And so absolutely, we've written cases with our summer 
uh, mid-level managers. One of our mid-level managers became the head of the National AIDS Program in Kenya, for example. And we wrote a case about him and his experience. And they actually helped bring, bring their colleagues um, from their settings and show the, why it's worthwhile. Absolutely. So I think it's because we're doing both, right? We have kind of this virtuous cycle that we have this touch point in person. We have a virtual communication and way to maintain that. Um, and now kind of our fact, how do we ensure all these early adopters are in sense incentivized to both participate and learn with us? How did you find out about your program? Mm. Thinking about their whole community <laughs> and how they might. Yes. I mean, I think of some of its virology that I haven't mapped out necessarily. We have a relationship. We're also um, developing courseware for new ministers of health um, with Dean Frank. So if you're a minister of health, um, so Earth becomes minister, you're, you're actually a minister of 18 months. And so you're a very high level physician typically in your country. You have no management expertise, but maybe your family is politically connected. And so Dean Frank and others train you here at Harvard if you'd like. Um, and so we get to meet those ministers of health as well. But I think most of it's honestly person to person. We get people recommended. Um, and there's a group uh, within the Harvard community that helps us um, get the word out. Yeah. Is the plan B to also integrate some of these graduates into your summer? Yes, exactly. So you could accrue, that's what we'd love to be able to do for this summer, is that you'd actually, in a sense, achieve some of that badge level in the summer course, right, to show its stackability over time. Um, and so the course that I run, management and global health delivery, could do that, for example, for supply chain management. We do those simulations within the courseware. Well, I like putting out these messy, hairy problems. <laughs> they don't necessarily have fine. I think two pieces that I've just pulled out is both um, the lexicon and I'd say the digital literacy piece of where our global health implementers need to learn and how we can learn from this community where to get the best training of that. And then in the sense, how do we ensure the incentives are leading to true certificates, right? That that certificate has meaning over time. Um, so those are two pieces. Yes, there's. On the latter piece, I think that's also obviously a very much a conversation that currently happens at the provost level mm -hmm. um, yeah. with Peter Ball, the question mm -hmm. as, you know, Harvard offers more and more courses online, mm -hmm. what's our comfort, comfort yeah. level to give out certificates, which Absolutely. is very political mm -hmm. for obvious yeah. reasons. So I think there is a lot of thinking mm -hmm. and also a lot of research happening mm -hmm. there and to tap into these conversations. Tremendous. If you haven't yeah. done so already, I would encourage you yeah. to do that and I know guys are very plugged in so but yeah. that to me is yeah, is perhaps the the yeah. right venue also mm -hmm. to get some of the latest thinking mm -hmm. not only institutionally but they're also mm -hmm. looking what competitors are doing yeah. so that, that to me seems low hanging fruit mm -hmm. I was just kind of I, I'm personally I'm less interested in the batches me personally but yeah. I'm very interested what I see on this chart <laughs> so um, you because that's kind of you could see that's the new Wikipedia for for yeah. medicine <laughs> uh, on a global yeah. scale yeah. that that's what this yeah. picture is about so David and, Blumenthal who's the president of the Commonwealth Fund thinks that we are crowdsourcing yeah. the healthcare yeah. Wikipedia exactly. sure. and how to keep doing that well right. and incentivize people right is to ensure that the content is quality so that you're learning the right content yeah. And it's not static content. It's even weirder because you, you, you're dealing with all tech levels at once because mm -hmm. access to resources is going to be so yeah. all over the map. So you yeah. need the answer for every century <laughs> up to now. Right? What's the yeah. best answer with excellent. 15th century technology? Yeah. Quarantine. Yeah. Quarantine. Yeah. 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 That's why I brought up quarantine, right. So, um, well, two things. One, our colleagues at Hinari have done just a tremendous job. This is the WHO affiliation for um, the major publications that are, that are made available. Um, and a good friend of our archival community um, is running that. And then the second is we have a um, long-standing partnership for five years with UpToDate, which is the premier evidence-based uh, clinical uh, ev um, evidence source. And so 160, is that right? I'm trying to think how many of our providers have it. About 10,000 providers from our GHN like we have free access to UpToDate. So we've been able to convince the commercial enterprise to participate in this. And now, actually, I have another project, if anyone's interested, is that UpToDate is willing to donate subscriptions to every single African medical school. We want to do Africa first, that every dean of every medical school in Africa has access to UpToDate. I need now a sales force to figure out how to generate that demand. And I'd love to get your take on this, because the um, analogy I use, which I don't know if it's right, but it's LexisNexis, that law students 
decided that this is such an important tool that they knocked on the doors of partners and said, I need this. I can't do my work. I will not work 100 hours <laughs> a week without it. And partners are like, what's this? Is this important? And then they started buying it, and obviously LexNexus saturated the market. Well, similar to UpToDate, there is no resident or medical student, especially in the Boston area and in this country, it's saturated uh, about 93% of the American market that doesn't use UpToDate on a daily basis. And so it's software, it's scalable, it's free. You can use the LexNexus business case to explain this to African medical school deans, I think would be just transformational for this generation. It's free, you said. Ah, uh, so no, it's very expensive. Ah. It's about, so it is free <laughs> if you're in a resource limit setting, you can apply for a free subscription through GHD Online. We assure that you're from a resource limited setting and then they give you free access. But if I was paying for my own individual subscription per, per year, it'd be $1,000 per year, likely for me as an subs individual subscriber. But isn't what you're building here to open source version of it? Um, so I would say this is in parallel. So up to date is, there's 40,000 randomized controlled trials that come out every year. And they are ensuring every six months that every form of pathophysiology is updated versus we're doing the non-clinical side, the management of disease, the management of systems, which there isn't an up-to-date for. Yeah. I think our points here about the importance of having a resource limited setting button is that the randomized controlled trials are based on being able to run a clinical trial, having that level of human resources, products, right, and a healthcare system around it. And so how do you then inform those who have one antibiotic, not 100, or one form of a cast for a patient, not seven? Um, as well. So and the discussions are mostly centered around these managerial issues, so to speak, Cor or, correct. or is it a blend also then? It's a blend. It's mainly to... the management of yeah. multi-drug resistant okay. tuberculosis, okay. not how do I clinically diagnose it. But once I have the PCR machine, how do I train people to use the I PCR see. machine? How do I ensure I have the right supplies? Well, this has been tremendous for us, and I appreciate because I know as um, with the lecture series, many people are thinking things on a very meta, meta scale, as I was watching some of them from last year. And I think on a daily basis, we think about our users. Um, and it's, so it's Lorenzo who keeps me up at night. It's our medical students in these countries that we know, in a sense, are trying to prepare themselves and contain this disease. And I think if you are interested in, in following the Ebola response, this is so emblematic of what's happening in our industry of global health is that people are shipping the product, they're being airlifted and sent in with no human resources, no understanding of how to use these products, and we're still use systems from the 17th century to quarantine patients. So I'm hoping, unfortunately though, it's such an acute situation that this will bring about some of these issues and we'll have a more global conversation, how to combat Ebola and be prepared for the next epidemic. I know that, that was a very nice sort of uh, uh, wrap up, and I still want to ask a question, though. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe a wrap up uh, question at your screen. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, a little bit. Um, uh, either now or perhaps on Friday, at Friday's meeting, um, these discussions are among healthcare professionals or non professional but dedicated you know, people. Yeah. Um, are there, do you think about ways, have you tried, or would you like to discuss now or on Friday, um, ways in which this can be expanded out so the information that's developed here can reach out to uh, counter some of the misinformation, for example, about Ebola? Is that yeah. something that you are already doing? Because this is yeah. fantastically No, we'd love to connect and we'll definitely participate on. On Friday, we start an Ebola response community, which is mainly for people trying to figure out who wants to volunteer and what resources you need prior to volunteering, for example, um, and some of the clinical issues uh, to prepare nurses um, and physicians who are going into the field. Um, but absolutely, I mean, I think we're all understanding that all the data that's out there is not necessarily good, and that leads to fear. Um, um, but it's for in this situation, we're trying to, how do we attract healthcare workforce who want to volunteer to get there and be properly funded and, and resourced? Thank you. Thank you, everyone.